Corey was called several times. His partner was like, oh, Ricky was called. <laughs> this is how we do it. This is how we uh, do it. Right. It's Friday night. I feel all right. The party's here on the west side. Talk about Tuesday morning and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. All right, family. A whole lot to get to today. Oh, yeah, my fault. We forgot the other one. What? Fine, fine, fine. Oh, uh, really? Fine, fine, <laughs> how does that fine, song fine, start? Fine, fine, fine. Mary J. Block. <laughs> I forgot how it starts. You said you forgot how it started. When I th 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 walking past the mirror, I can't think of how I go now. Okay. Uh, yes, if you can. You got it? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Somebody get dressed this morning and get ready to say You know I love music. Hey, you know I love me, right? Come on now. You know wait, I love a minute, me, right? wait a minute. Wait a minute. It makes me want to have fun. Make me want to have more but fun with myself. You understand? Not with myself. Yeah, yeah right. all day. Nobody right. can be you but you. That all right. Day. Oh, you know what? Dang. Party in the house and just just kick it by myself. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, don't get twisted now. What? Don't get twisted. What's uh, your name? George told you, uh, George Clinton always said, nothing is good unless you play with it. You understand? So, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I'm just saying. I, 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 let the funk move. No, never, heard heard moves and removes. never heard that. I'll play it for you. Moving right yeah. along. Too early in the morning for that visual. You know what Steve oh Hood. my God. You know what Steve Please Hood. stop. You know what Steve <laughs> you are outrageous. Right? Nobody can be. I am appalled. <laughs> Inappropriate. You know what Bobby Womack said, right? <laughs> no, I don't. It's cool if you can have it. <laughs> I try to hear about you and how to eat other perms. Just fine, 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 fine. So you don't mess up, Mary J. Wow. I'm very right. messed up, Mary well, uh, Anyway. Okay. So a couple of things. First of all, for those of you that have to leave the house this morning, I don't care if it's even just to take out your trash, to pull the receptacle to the front. If you got to do like we do up to the, you know, to the, to the corner. Um, it is slippery. And icy outside, the weather uh, about, mixed today. We talking about first step fall if you ain't paying attention. Exactly, exactly. And I got some people that you know trying to drive off fast. I'm not saying it's full black ice, but it looks like you know there are pockets where the roads are icy, and your tires could easily hit something, and you go swerving, careening, sliding, whatever. Careening. Careening, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Use that you know, I careen into the other car. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and, so, so basically. And if you're able to use that word in your police report, you're probably going to be found not liable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, right. <laughs> because you are someone who has right. careened in your vocabulary. So it's warm enough that even though it looks dry, it, I mean, it's wet out there. And there's water dripping off your house. And dripping off of everything else, so it's the freeze is. But the, yeah, they, they're saying it's, 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 a water, it's, it's water on ice. Wintry mix of freezing rain and snow. We're looking at um, most of the day today. It is going to be, and it is slick outside, up to a um, like possible like almost inch of glaze. That's what they're calling it on the street. Yeah. You know, like this glaze. That's what we call um, one or two inches of wet snow. Uh, the mix is done by 2 or 3 p.m. today is what they're saying. But right now, yeah, if you're moving yeah, around, yeah, particularly yeah. if you, and I was going to say particularly if you are older, but anybody, because even just walking into the radio station this morning, I was about to own WNOV because that sidewalk is a hot, slippery mess coming up. The it, it took me just, I was tiptoeing. I know people was laughing at me when I was trying to <laughs> walk up the sidewalk because literally I was tiptoeing because I was so worried about falling. Well, you know the Commodore say, right? What do the Commodore say? Slippery when wet. Oh my God. That's a song. Carvey, you laugh one more time at his foolishness. Carvey is the young brother in the radio station with us. Um, you can actually watch us on uh, what is it, Facebook? Facebook Live WNOV 860. 860, uh, AM 860. AM 860. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, you can watch us live. I need to actually like connect to my Facebook page so I can whatever I'm supposed to do for my own Facebook page. So y'all can go there as well. But, uh, so I just have to say that, have to say that, please, please, please. And if you are a homeowner, take care of your property so that people that have to move back and forth on your um, portion of the sidewalk don't injure themselves, please. We got children trying to walk to school. You know what Jackie uh, Brown said, right? 
Lord have mercy. He said, please, please, please. <laughs> is that is that what I said? You know, it's funny. It's funny that you mentioned, didn't you mention Bobby Womack this morning? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's cool if you can handle it. Right. Yeah. So last night I was watching. So I have been doing this thing the last probably week where, because I don't get to watch a ton of TV. I don't get to watch a ton of movies, all that kind of stuff. So I don't care what time I go to bed. Like if I end up going to bed at two or three o'clock in the morning, I have been watching, just catching up where the rest of the world is. I'm, I'm catching up. All these shows that I have not seen, documentaries that I have on my to-do list that I have not made it around to uh, watching. And last night I watched a documentary on Sam Cooke. Oh, which one? Which one? The two, the two murders, murders of Sam, Sam Cook. Oh God! And the the history and the things you have, like number one, I didn't realize a change is gonna come was released after his death. Mm -hmm. That he had written that song and his he had recorded it, and his boys had even said, you know, Sam, that sounds like a song about death. And he was like, well, basically it is because I'm transitioning to you know, a new, a new Sam in that my connection to the civil rights movement, what I want to sing about, what I want to talk about. But that song was released after his death. The other thing that, the reason why I brought up Bobby Womack is Bobby Womack used to be a part of a group called the Valentinos. Mm -hmm. the Womack Brothers. And they talked about that the Rolling Stones, their very first hit, people mistakenly think it's whatever the first hit they people think it is, it was actually another song. And that song was in fact written by Bobby Womack. I used to love him. I don't know if that's it. Oh, is I, that, I, I, it, some, it's it had the word all in it, I thought. I'll, I'll go back and oh, look. Yeah, I, uh, but that, that, that Bobby Womack had actually written this song and that the Rolling Stones sought out Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke had started his own record label, SAR Records, S-A-R, and that um, the Rolling Stones actually sought out Sam Cooke um, to ask him to do this, this song, you know, do something for him. And he worked with Bobby Womack and Bobby Womack actually wrote this song. And they talked about how the record industry, because the whole idea is like who really killed Sam Cooke? Because ultimately they ended up, you know, Sam Cooke was found murdered. I mean, he was shot but by this black woman. Time. I used to love her, but it's all over now. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, but Sam Cooke was actually, uh, they said, you know, he had met this uh, woman at a bar or a club. They went back to a hotel. Um, at the hotel, the woman claims he tried to rape her. She ran out the door, but she took his pants when she ran out the door. Um, and Sam Cooke earlier that night had been seen with like $5,000 in his pocket. All right. And the people had told him, like, Sam, you know, don't let everybody know you got that kind of bread. The woman, you know, she was a white woman. She did her whole white woman tears. He tried to rape me. And then when Sam Cook gets up to run out of the apartment because he realizes, what, I mean, the hotel room because he realizes what happens, he knocks on this door because uh, he thinks that the woman went into this other, um, uh, you know, hotel room. A black woman comes out and shoots Sam Cook in the you know chest and torso three times. And sat next to his wife at the funeral. Yeah, yeah, okay. They got the picture. <laughs> and this is the thing that you know so crazy. Later they end up finding out the white woman, in fact, was a prostitute. Wasn't the white woman? Uh, what well, Italian? She was. She wasn't she was sister. A black, yeah, she was. She no, was a mm -mm, black mm -mm. It was a black hotel. Mm -mm. Go look at the phone. I mean, look at I, I, I know the that story. chick was not black. She, my grandmama and them don't look black when they young. And mine didn't either. She wasn't black. I don't care what she said. I looked at her on that on that um, witness stand, and it was so crazy because they the the woman who was with Sam Cook and the black woman who shot him both testified with shades on. I thought that that was like you think about you wearing shades in a courtroom in the sixties. Like who who would have did that? And they both sat there with shades on, you know, during this whole, their testimony. Sam Cook's wife is shaking her head vehemently through the testimony. Um, everybody that knows him was like, Sam Cook was not violent. He would have never did it. Nobody believed it. Basically, nobody believed it. But just the history behind who this brother was, the way he got cheated by this Jewish white guy, um, who still owns his rights. That's why Alan his, Klein. That's why none of his music was played during that documentary. Right. 
because Alan Klein, who originally approached Sam Cooke to say, hey, I believe RCA Vector Records is cheating you um, on some, you know, you know, ro royalties or profit or whatever. They did an audit. Sam Cooke ends up trusting this dude. He ends up creating this company, telling Sam Cooke, we're going to be able to create a spinoff where you will be the president. I will be the secretary. And you, you know, have access to. Well, this, she this, she, this she was more handsome Asian in her, but she a blend. That's why she was. Yeah, at the I know she hotel. ain't just straight no sister. Well, I know a sister okay. that looked just like her. I, yeah. I did. Well, all right. So we going we gonna go with that. Um, but the the guy Sam Cook ends up getting the flu, gets sick. So while he's laid up, he starts reviewing the contract. And he realizes that this guy, this Jewish guy, has given himself ownership of Sam's company. And while on paper it says Sam is the president and this guy is the secretary, the way the contract was written, Sam actually was an employee right. of this guy. Yeah. When Sam realizes it, he starts talking publicly about the fact that I am getting ready to break this contract. I'm getting ready to fire this dude. Um, right. and that was like just say on a Thursday or Friday by the weekend, Sam Cook was dead, right? And you know, so people have tried to figure out like what went on. They talked about the music industry, he was too powerful. He had started to kick it, him, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Jim Brown. Um, this was a circle he was moving in. So people began to worry about how powerful Sam Cooke was becoming because while we think of the music, when you watch the documentary, you realize how much of a civil rights activist and a race man that right. Sam Cooke was. So, they, 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 and then Johnny Taylor was in it. They talked about Johnny oh, Taylor. So you know Johnny always replaced Sam when he left a group. Yes. He always, when he left the highway, the, uh, the highway QCs, he, Johnny Taylor took over. And when he left the Soul Stirrers, Johnny took over. And then when he made it, he took Johnny and the Valentinos with him. Yeah. So, but who who was it that uh, ended up marrying Sam Cooke's wife? Bobby. <laughs> and they said it was wearing his clothes. Bobby, but Bobby, and, and, and Bobby <laughs> took it. Bobby got it. Ooh, that's so, a whole other story. So, you know, that but, was you know what's crazy, though? Bobby was a baby. I, I, you gotta remember, I, Bobby I, was twelve when Sam then brought him over. So it's like the, but that wasn't the point. The point was, he had a relationship with her. Then he started sleeping with their daughter. Right. So that's where it got. Real I mean, mad, I, I'm, right? I'm on my way. I'm just like Bobby was trifling, bro. He right. had, you know, because I'm not wearing your your clothes, fam. I'm just, but you know, I'm not um, doing but that. but if the older woman say, try this on, he ain't gonna never wear it no more. He don't know no better. You no, just, no, sorry. Your man. I'm not I mean, wearing you, your ex wife's you, clothes. You I mean, your deceased you, wife's clothes. You grown. I'm not doing it. <laughs> you grown. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's crazy? And there, there was a, 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 a something I got on YouTube. It's an actual triangle because some other brother. They end up having babies by more than one Womack. It was real trifling. Yeah, it was I, I, I mean, <laughs> you just realize it all. But I don't want to get mired yeah, yeah, in yeah. the muck of it. But, but just to be, a, you got something? It's the Valentino. Okay. Uh, which one of Womack brothers? How old was he when he wrote like 13, 14? Yeah, he was a teenager. used to stay out all night long. She made me cry. She did me wrong. She had my nose open. That stole my <laughs> table's turning now. It's a good time to cry. Because I This the hit from the Rolling Stones. Well, baby used to stay out all night long. She made me cry. She done me wrong. She hurt my eyes open. That's no lie. Tables turning now. Hot time to cry because I used to love. Her. That's so crazy. That ain't crazy. I mean, you, you remember what he said? He said, I was mad as hell, and the check came. I was like, they want some more songs? But you know what But the thing was, and, and they talked about the immaculate records that Sam Cooke kept. And so you could see where he had written a song, and uh, no, 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 I'm confusing that, because that's uh, Quincy Jones. When Quincy Jones said he had written songs, and he's like, I got paid 12 50 
for a song, $12.50, $25 oh, yeah, for yeah. a song. And these people go on and make millions. Um, the one thing that was so, you know, sad and frustrating, in addition to this white guy um, ending up scamming Sam Cooke out of owning the rights to all his music, um, is that his wife sold away whatever else she had for a mere $50,000. Right. And people were like, even then, the stuff was worth millions of dollars. Right, right. And now, she sold it away for fifty. And don't grand. get it twisted. Sam was not a. Sam was a was was a. He was he was very savvy with business. Yeah. Because it, so the man had to be real cold to slide it in there. And like what did I say though? And when Sam hadn't hadn't had time to really review everything, yeah. so when Sam got sick and yeah. was able to lay That's back what it was. and review it, yeah. and Sam and he he found it. Yeah. Did nobody have to show it to him? Right. He found it like. Uh, because people, uh -huh. people don't understand that SARS record was the top before Motown. Exactly. You know what I'm exactly. saying? And, exactly. And Sam and Jackie Wilson was the top. They was like, Sam Cooke was before Barry Gordy. Yeah. You know, Barry Gordy ends up being basically yeah. a Sam Cooke in the industry and in the game in terms of, you know, Sam Cooke was like, we need to own our own publishing. Oh, see, he talked to Fast Domino. No, yeah, look, <laughs> I'm just saying. So, so also Jackie Wilson was so big that they used to tell Elvis, you know, they say Jackie is the white Elvis. So what do you think about that? And Elvis said that makes me the black Jackie Wilson. Now Sam Cooke and Jackie Wilson was the top black artist. So well, they, was... they said in the documentary, <laughs> Sam Cooke had, was the second best seller behind Elvis. Elvis yeah. And then he and Elvis ended up becoming boys. Yeah. So you know, uh, he, wasn't, so... he wasn't by far slipping. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, you know, like I said, if you have not taken time, um, and this was on Netflix, I saw this on Netflix, but, if you have not taken the time to go back and watch some of this stuff, because um, as we go to break and I see you call her, I, I do have to um, go to break, but I'm, I'll try and squeeze you in. But as you know, we need to understand and be reminded in some cases, again, who we are as a people, how brilliant, how talented, how industries have been made off our backs, how people have cheated us for years. And a lot of people don't understand the frustration that black folks have. Um, but black people know, they know how they have been, you know, used, abused, taken advantage of, cheated, not giving proper credit for the work that they've done. People trying to tell you, you stupid while stealing from you at the same time. You know, that's the, that's the frustrating part. Uh, when I have watched some of these documentaries, I looked at the Nina Simone documentary and, you know, you just realize this sister is brilliant, but she's bipolar schizophrenic. And at some point that ends up, you know, consuming her for a while. But Nina Simone hits rock bottom. But then I see her in this documentary singing Young, Gifted and Black at this university of 18,000 people, which only had 300 black students on the entire campus. And I see the faces of those students while she's singing to them and doing stuff that folks have, are telling black musicians fall back. They was trying to tell Jackie um, Wilson that. They was trying to tell Sam Cooke that. Fall back. They sent Sammy Davis Jr. to talk to Sam Cooke to be like, bruh, leave this race stuff alone. You need to fall back because Sam Cooke has started to say, I will not perform in segregated venues. Yeah. What I look like having these white kids all jumping up, dancing around me while my people up in the rafters, you know, can't can't move and can't can't come down here and party with me. Uh, Big Mo, Big Mo, called, it's called the two, ki the two killings of Sam Cooke. It's, if you go to Netflix and you just type in Sam Cooke, it'll come up. Mm -hmm. The two kids. And you uh, also... Um, the greatest one I've ever seen, it came out about 15, 20 years ago. It's called Legend. And that's the one with his brother, Aretha. Aretha talking yeah. about sneaking through the hotel and whatever uh, bad blood. Yeah, <laughs> they mentioned that. Um, and even in this one, Dion Warwick. When yeah. Dion Warwick tells a story about uh, Sam Cooke, they were traveling and she was, you know, singing with them and she was traveling with them. Yeah. They go into a restaurant to get something to eat. The wife, they sit down, the white folks tell them, get up. And uh, Dion Warwick said, you know, she said to the guy, the manager or whatever at the restaurant, like, oh, you're not going to take our order? Yeah. And he was like, I'll take it when I get ready. But right now, get up. You know, he talked real crazy to Dion Warwick. So Dion Warwick told him, you can take that order and stick it up your behind. Yeah. Then they leave. Yeah. They 10 minutes down the road on the tour bus, the police pull over the tour bus. Yeah. Dion Warwick said she was like, oh, snap. Police get on the bus. Sam Cook gets up. Yes, can I help you? Officer, yeah, we looking for them two gals that was talking slick back in the restaurant. 
Dion Warwick said her eyes like, oh, oh. Sam Cook said, well, we don't have no gals on this bus. Oh, he wasn't playing. We got ladies and gentlemen. Right. And officer, this is my property. Yeah. And I'm going to need you to get off of it. Right. And the police got off of it. Right. And Dion Warwick was like, damn. <laughs> on, on, on the legend documentaries, you know, him and Lou Rawls was boys. Yeah. They were even in an accident. I mean, they always, Lou Rawls was one of his backup singers and they sang in the gospel groups. So he grew up with him in Chicago. And he said, Sam, you know, he wasn't rah rah. You know, they had to go through the gang stuff then in right. the 40s. He said, but Sam had the girl. Sam walked through and said, look here, we're going to walk through here. So everybody likes Sam. Right. Because he had the girl. Right. He said, I'm going to walk through here every day and I don't want no trouble. And I'm still going to walk through here today, and we ain't going to have no trouble. So then his brother is telling of an incident when they had a flat on the highway. And the officer pulled up and said, y'all niggas, y'all got to get up and move this car. And he said, we, we waiting, and we going to walk and get some gas. He said, you got to push this car. Sam Cook said, I don't push no cars. I'm a singer. I don't push cars. I sang. If you don't know who I am, go ask your wife. I know she know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I I'm just because, yeah, like, when you think about, like, even why he had a tour bus, because he said something in the um in the documentary that was crazy. He said that he had missed a gig because he got to he arrived he arrived in town, got to the airport, but the city that he flew into white cab drivers would not pick him up at the airport to take him to his destination. Black cab drivers were not permitted to pick up fares at the airport. And so he ultimately ends up missing it. So he was like, yeah, I can fix all of that. So he made sure he had his own mode of transportation when he would arrive into different, you know, towns. Can you think about that? That and some of the folks that are listening to this station right now, they know and can talk about how black cab drivers were prohibited from pulling up to the airport to pick up fares. Couldn't do it. So that's the thing that blows me away and that is so um phenomenal about seeing these stories they show him in the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King will subsequently be killed a few years later and then they do that sequence of Sam Cooke being killed, Malcolm X being killed uh, Mega Evers being killed and not necessarily in this order but uh, all of these, these critical and significant brothers in history all falling like dominoes in this short span of time and ultimately culminating with Dr. King's death. So let me go to the phone line, get this caller in real quick, because uh, you've been holding. Hey, caller, what's happening? Hello? Hello? Yeah, but... Hey, Michelle, I don't want to say anything, but like I told you yesterday, they ain't doing nothing. All they do is steal. That's all they know how to do. Yeah, it, it was. It, it's yeah. infuriating to watch it when you see. Yeah, how I we watched were that done. documentary with Sam Cooke about four years ago, because that's been out for a while, maybe right. three years ago. But yeah, I think it was some stuff in the game, George, you know how they did him. I think it was over those over those records. I don't think it was like that how it went down. I mean, you never know, but I think they 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 killed that man. I think they murdered oh, yeah. that man. That was something they said in the documentary because Sam was known for the finer things in life. He take oh, his thank wife. You, you know, thank you, uh, George. It, thanks, George. George is the one that told me about it. Even on um um what was it one night in Va mm -hmm. one night in uh uh miami miami yeah you know he going to the white hotel she's like i did fine down at the black hotels so that's what they said sam could have had any woman he wanted right and, and, and he liked finer hotels so why he end up with this chick yeah a prostitute now, this right yeah and that's what the first thing i right. thought before i even got into the whole backstory i was like Everything that had led up to that moment was like, nah, this wasn't his dude MO. Right. This was not his MO at all. Uh, and the one thing one of the, the performers said, he said, you know, Sam Cooke, they talked about how he was a good manager with his money and how he did stuff. And they talked about, yeah, because a lot of black artists, they would pay him with cocaine. Right. You wouldn't get a check. They would give you oh, cocaine. Yeah, even George Clinton was dirty for that. That, that like, was like crazy. Like, what? Yeah, they would give you okay. So anyway, I won't belabor it. Um, but it just is one of those things. Like I said, I'm just catching up. I'm I'm finally getting I see, the chance. I see you Man, watching. I mean, I'm on a roll too. I'm on a roll. I'd have knocked down the Nina Simone one. 
Uh, I did uh, Quincy Jones. Miles you Davis know. is gangster too. I'm, that's my next one. That's this weekend. I'm going to get that in. So uh, I'm just encouraging people, go back revisit review take time when you see some of these things on television you know step away from the norm and educate yourself because i felt like i got an education every time i for every documentary i've watched i've been able to connect another dot i'm like oh snap so that's how this happened and that's how these two got together and you know okay let me grab this caller because everybody's trying to get in i'm gonna go ahead and get you hey caller what's happening is this me? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, hey, so the real. Hey, how are you? All right. <laughs> Happy New Year, both of you. Thank you. So, so real quick, the real reason Sam Cook was murdered is because he, um, Otis Redding, and James Brown, they were going to start their own distribution yeah. company, yeah. and they wanted to cut yeah. that off. Um, when, when Sam and, uh, Otis were killed, James Brown backed out. But that's the reason why those two brothers are no longer with us. Thank you for that additional insight. I You're appreciate welcome. it. You yes, ma'am. I, I forgot. I, and I had, Otis I remember that from the old, too. yeah, Otis wasn't no joke. He had his own publishing company yeah. and his own record. And he had his record company, but he had his own And, and I'm going to tell you, that's the thing. And I'm going to try to say this and be as respectful. He died at 28 and had an airplane. Died, yeah, they, was, and and they was all young, though, if you think about it. Most of them, like, I was just thinking about that. And I'm going to talk about the fact that Dexter King, Martin Luther King, Jr.'s son, uh, died yesterday at the age of 62 from prostate cancer. And I'm like, you know, so you got to do almost 30 years more than your dad did. All of these cats were dying young uh, and, and, and they were being murdered young. I should say even in that way. Uh, the thing that was so crazy is, and like I said, I'm gonna try and be as respectful as I can when I say it, but brothers who in the face of, for some people, they might have believed insurmountable odds. Brothers who, when they made moves, they understood that they could lose their life. Not because I'm out in the streets doing dirt no. and trying to harm somebody, but because I'm trying to better myself, better my condition, better my community, better my race, better our outcomes. So, you know, and that's that why that irony of, you know, white people who talk that nonsense about, you know, people being lazy, shiftless, get some, you know, bootstraps. And when people tried to put boots on, you came and you stole them. You know, you killed them for wanting the boots. You killed them for how dare you have nicer boots than mine. And that that has been an inherent part of the frustration because I look at brothers today who are way better positioned than black men in the sixties and fifties and forties and thirties. And you say black man and woman, do you understand what you are capable of? Do you, do you understand that a lot of the inherent challenges that these brothers faced when they were still making moves, some of those things have been knocked down for you. We should own it all. We should be so much more empowered than we are because we was doing it when A, we had nothing and B, we could have got killed for it. Nobody's going to kill you today if you go get your education. Nobody's going to kill you necessarily today if you go and try to have a successful business. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some businesses that they end up getting attacked. I know it. I see it. But many of the things, you know, you can make, you can move up and down this highway for the most part and not be bothered and be, and be, you know, worried about your life and scared to stop in this town or that town. And I, you walk away from it and like, are we squandering on some level, some level, everything that was done foundationally to put us in the position we are in right now? Let me go to the phone line. Hey, caller, what's happening? Well, good morning and thank you. Good, good morning, morning. Good morning, nephew. What's up, G? All right. Good morning, Milwaukee. Tyrone W. speaking. Uh, a couple of different things. Well, uh, condolences to um, the Martin family over Dexter. I, I didn't know that. I'm just learning that this morning myself. So, uh, young, uh, decent young man, just like his um, his mother and his dad. Uh, so, 
but rest, you know, rest peacefully. So Bernice and uh, Martin Jr., you know, um, for the task of coming up ahead there. Uh, it should be pretty big there, but rest peacefully. You know, he's, he's got his wings now. He's, he's with his mom and dad again there <laughs> and his sister, Yolanda. Back together again with them, so Dexter. But anyway, uh, I you know so so much to the Sam Cooke thing. I mean, I you know uh, coming out of Detroit myself, there um, being born, uh, you know you could even say you know the, the, the different things that were said. You know, why did Marvin Gaye go to jail? You know, was it be, uh, because of something that, that took place behind Tammy Terrell? There, you know, he took some fell out behind Tammy Terrell's death. So, so, so many things that are unclear, you know, uh, but with Sam and Bobby, you know, uh, you know, I think you really trust me too much. He's the best friend I've got. Give him the shirt off my back. You know, it makes you wonder, you know, read between the lines. There, was that, you know, did, did Bobby Womack uh, present that song um, on behalf of Sam Cooke there with, you know, like you said, with the older woman and then the daughter and all that. So you, one can read between the lines there because our music, the message is like the OJ said, you know, we've got a message in our music. There's a message in our song. You've got to listen to the music and read between the lines there. But that song may have been dedicated to Sam and the, 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 the woman, the daughter and all that, that you know, what, what was going on. But, you know, we've got the same good taste. You're right. You, you sure do. <laughs> in more than one way. But... <laughs> But yeah, so just just wanted to say that. Uh, uh, All right. Um, thank you. Really trust me too much. Uh, you it's, know, it's but a, yeah, it's yeah. a good example. Thank you so hey, much. I and, appreciate and it, Carl. One before you go, because I know you gonna switch up on the other side. When you right. talk about power of the young folks, when you watch that Sam Cooke legend documentary, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's comprehensive. It's amazing, um, and the soundtrack also. It, it's very in depth. But I didn't realize that. Folks start wearing naturals because of Sam Cooke. Cook. Yeah, and that's, that's, <laughs> in this, that's in this. That's in this. Oh, they one. said that too. Yeah, because okay. Smokey Robinson yeah. is interviewed in this this documentary, and Smokey Robinson said that Sam Cooke basically was the reason brothers start rocking afros, yeah. and everybody was wearing that process. Yeah, and then was, Sam yeah. Cooke, you know, eventually one day said, "That's enough of that." Came out with his afro. And then he, Smokey Robinson even talked about his mama had a fit, like, oh, no, what's yeah, going on? Yeah, yeah. And but Smokey Robinson said, as soon as brothers saw cool Sam Cooke yeah. switch to the Afro, they switched. it was over. And remember, he was the number one gospel singing in, in the yes. country when he was 16. Right. So right. Yeah, they was following him. Yeah, he was a Too bad boy. Power. He was a bad boy. All right, y'all, let me take a break. Michelle Bryan, WNOV, 860 AM, 106.5 FM. Be right back.
Let me get to a couple of things. So definitely I want to acknowledge the passing of Dexter Scott King. Uh, Dexter Scott King, who was the son, one of the sons of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, was born January 30th, 1961 in Atlanta. He was actually named for the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, where his father had first emerged as a leader in the civil rights uh, movement in the 1950s. Um, following in the tracks of generations of the men in his family, he went to uh, Morehouse uh, College and uh, he left, though, before he actually graduated from Morehouse. Uh, he was married, married Leah Weber in 2013, and she um, survives him, as does his brother Martin, younger sister Bernice. And the previous caller mentioned that the uh, older uh, King child, Yolanda King, actually passed away. I cannot believe it was 2007. Like it has been that long. That is so crazy to me. Uh, Yolanda King, Senator Taylor and I were with Yolanda King. She was here in Wisconsin uh, for an event. And we were with her shortly before she died. And, you know, I, I had to go back and think when I saw this story in the New York Times, like, first of all, dang, it's been like almost 14 years. And then you realize, you know, you watching these people pass in, in real time. Uh, a lot of people know that Dexter King uh, was mired frequently in controversy. Uh, there was a lot of fights about uh, his father's legacy and image. Dexter King actually was the individual that managed his father's um, image and licensing of his likeness. When the King Memorial was being built in DC, there was a whole bunch of drama about that. And what the King family, uh, per perhaps Dexter wanted to be paid to even, somebody's building a statue monument of this magnitude on the National Mall to honor your father. And I think that the price that the family under Dexter's leadership wanted to charge the group to do it was a million dollars. And it was like, what are you doing? This is big, what, what? So there were a lot of such controversies. The family had, uh, you know, the, the children, the siblings had not been speaking. There was something, I'm trying to remember what it was that recently brought all of them together. And they appeared on one of the morning shows, national morning shows and the interviewer, which might have been Gail King, actually said, is this the first time you all have been together? And they basically say, yeah, this first time we've been in a room together because of the infighting uh, that went on. And so, you know, it, it's, it's sad that it happens this way. Me and Keon was talking before the show, or Keon and I were talking before the show started. Dexter King was seven years old when his dad was assassinated uh, in 1968. Um. He and his brother, they said, were at home sitting on the floor. His brother, uh, Martin III, 10 years old at the time, sitting on the floor of their home in Atlanta watching the TV when a news bulletin reported the shooting. Um, so you at home watching TV, and it comes across the TV screen. And at seven, you old enough to understand what's happening. For sure you do at 10, that somebody is saying that your dad has been shot. The two boys raced into their uh parents' bedroom where their mother was on the phone getting the same news from one of Dr. King's associates. Uh, so the King Center, many of you who have gone to Atlanta have made a, a point to visit the King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. Uh, Coretta Scott King established that, created that, served as the president and CEO of uh, the organization until 1989 when she 
uh, passed the reins to Dexter King. And it is at that time that people began to talk about that Dexter King fought almost immediately with his mother. Um, and he soon left the position. Like a lot of people in Atlanta was pissed off with Dexter King about the way he was making moves and how he was behaving. Um, at some point, Dexter and his mom did make up and he returned in 1994 to the center. Um, but by that time, the center has suffered, you know, years of mismanagement, declining income, uh, visitors. And, you know, so budget cuts, personnel cuts, they began to try to figure out how to save, you know, this, this center. And um, so it's just one of those things that as you looked at it, you know, people were like, well, did he ever really do a whole lot? You know, because think about being the child of Dr. King. You know, think about being a child of Malcolm X. Think about being a child of some of the, of the most influential people in our history and what that has to mean to A, either try to live up to that, to understand how your parent was taken away. Um, it, it, it has got to be one of those things that if it doesn't keep you on the therapy couch, I don't know what will. So at this point, they are saying that he died from prostate cancer. Um, once again, a reminder for brothers in this community uh, to make sure that you are doing those annual checkups uh, so that if there is a problem, that things can be caught in a timely manner, you know, where possible to provide the, the type of medical care that you need. He died at home. And, um, you know, so hopefully... Uh, there is peace. It's nothing worse. And I don't know. I don't know what the relationship was like with he and his siblings as he, you know, entered his last days, but hopefully there is peace. Uh, so it's just two of the children left now, Martin III and Bernice. And it's so crazy how all of this lines up because Bernice is the most like her father. She's a reverend. She speaks her cadence, her ability to deliver. I have heard this girl deliver a sermon that will drop you to your knees or get you off your behind and down at the altar. So powerful. Uh, one of her speeches, I used to listen to it like every other day just because, because it was so good. I used to live in Atlanta and I would just replay the speech over and over again, her, her sermon. Actually, it wasn't a speech, it was a sermon because it was so good. And I just, every time I heard it, I got chills. I'll have to pull it up uh, and play it one day on the air. Martin III gets the name. Dexter looked exactly like his daddy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he looked exactly like his father. Yeah. It's so crazy. And Yolanda was a hybrid of King and Car I mean, of Dr. King and, and Miss Coretta. My, 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 and the third looked like he would have looked had he lived and got became a grandpa. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, nah. He looked like, yeah, he looked the, like Papa. But Dr. Like King just seemed like he was like that kind of svelte dude that never yeah. would have got chubby. But see, yeah. that's because he was how old? 35? I mean, he was 39. 39, when he yeah. Uh, the third I don't know that he would have ever right. got. I don't know. But he might have. I don't know. Maybe. But no, I think Dexter got that way from Coretta because Coretta on their side. You just always want to see tweets. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. I told people when my son went to Alabama State, I met with a group of folks that were Alabama State alumni. And I was talking to these sisters and they were saying that Dr. King was on campus with them when they was at Alabama State. Yeah, and they said, tweet. yeah, you know, we called him Tweed. Yeah. I said, y'all called him what? Tweed. Tweed. I was like, Tweed said that boy used to be shy. He said the little pants is what he used to wear. And I didn't but realize. they said he was a little boy. We was like, get away from us, boy. He, like he was young. He was, I mean, when he was moving around on, on state's campus, he was older, but he was younger than them. Yeah, you know, but they, they, yeah, he graduated just, at like 16. Yeah, he graduated like from um high school at 16. He went to college at 16. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he yeah. went to college at 16. We kind of like, baby. yeah, and so you know, so it, it just a heck of a thing. So, definitely wanted to stop for a second, acknowledge that. And Senator Taylor put out a statement regarding uh his passing, um, and you know, just talked about the fact that it's crazy that. <laughs> upon learning about the death of Dexter, many of the issues and challenges and fights that Dr. King was fighting 
in the 50s and 60s, we still fight them today. Or they've been rekindled and renewed because there is a push, you know, to um, to return us to uh, just this awfully unfair and inequitable period in history in this country, as Nikki Haley can't figure out if this has ever been a racist country or not. Uh, so I just want to say that. And in terms of speaking of statements being put out uh, and some of these same challenges, Senator Taylor also put out a statement last night regarding the incident that happened at UW Whitewater. So by now, many of you may have heard that on Sunday night, uh, students, uh, as they were preparing to go back to class for the session to start, were confronted with an ugly reminder of the racism that exists in this country that Nikki Haley says she has no idea is there. So I got to take a break. But when I come back, I will talk about what set the campus on fire. And I uh, got Senator Taylor to release a statement. Not a lot of statements I could see have come out, but it's stuff that you can't let go unchecked. I'll talk about it on the other side of the break.
All right, family, welcome back to the show. So before I went to the break, I said I was going to reference an incident that occurred on the UW Whitewater campus. Uh, I'm connecting this to the whole conversation around civil rights, around understanding the challenges that we have faced as uh, a community and black people uh, specifically, and how even in acknowledging the passing of Dexter King, many of the son of, uh, civil rights icon, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that how many of the, the challenges and issues that Dr. King fought when he was alive, in his son's death, some almost 30 years later, we still are fighting many of those challenges, you know? And so at UW-Whitewater, there was a situation in which students came out uh, on Sunday night of their dorms and they found that someone had taken like a projector and put an image of a swastika on a side of one of the buildings. And then they were uh, chanting racist uh, chants and, you know, talking about there will be, uh, sorry, there will be blood, there will be blood, there will be blood. And this group evidently is known to the university. Uh, there have been, uh, sightings and or complaints about these. Uh, they said they identify four people that they saw doing this, but that they have been going around the country doing this on campuses. I had never heard this before. I had not heard about this group terrorizing and showing up on college campuses, you know, with the swastika nonsense and then, you know, racially derogatory terms towards black people. Uh, and then talking about there will be blood, there will be blood. So the university said, you know, these are not our students. We've beefed up, you know, security and patrols. Students, you should feel safe. Da 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 da. Uh, Senator Taylor put out a statement last night uh, in relationship to this whole situation, and her statement, uh, in part, read: "For those who seek to tell us, don't believe your lying eyes, while professing that we have moved on beyond racism. Here is yet another example of the work that remains to be done." In this state and nation, on issues of race, diversity, equity, and inclusion, dismantling DEI departments on university campuses, making diversity a dirty word, and demonizing efforts to raise awareness of bias and inequitable practices, even in workplaces, contributes to these types of ignorant acts. She goes on to say some other stuff, but just the idea, Senator Taylor had been getting called to the UW-Whitewater campus, the UW-Milwaukee campus, to UW-Madison campus for years. She is not the senator in UW-Whitewater, while some of her constituents attend UW-Whitewater. She is not the senator for UW-Madison, but black students would always figure out a way to call and find Lena to come and be a voice for them on campus, to meet with them just individually as students to reassure them that there was somebody in a position of authority that was paying attention to what was going on with them, willing to speak out on their behalf and come up on the campus and raise hell to be able to make sure that they were okay. That could get the ear of the university presidents and talk to these people about the safety of these, these young folks on these campuses. I've gone to some of those meetings. I've participated in them. I definitely have taken the phone calls from students who have said racial foolishness is happening on the yard or on these campuses up here. We're being run off the road by racist people in pickup trucks. We don't feel safe walking back and forth to class or across the campus at night. You know, it's those things that you never, ever think about in connection to a legislator's job, particularly someone who has been seen as a legislator for the state. Lena was is not seen as a legislator from Milwaukee. She is seen as a legislator for the state. Racine basically believes that Lena is their legislator, the black folks in Racine, because that's who they call, because they no longer have anybody of color in the legislature, Bob Turner was their person. 
State Representative Bob Turner for years. Bob Turner leaves the legislature and the black folks in Racine, when drama jump off in Racine, they call Lena. They call Lena. And she goes. She's in the midst of they stuff just like she in the midst of Milwaukee. When, when the international press came, it was her face on international. You know, one of my friends was actually in France and said, don't you work for Lena Taylor? And I was like, yeah. I'm looking at her on the news in France. I am over here right now in Paris. They're talking about the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting and the unrest and everything that's going on. And I'm looking at her face in France, in Paris right now. The need to be vocal about what is happening, to speak up and speak out, even when it's uncomfortable, even when you have to do it alone, go it alone. I keep talking about what the hallmarks of real leadership look like. And I think about a Sam Cooke who at some point in his career, they wouldn't play his music because some of his music was now becoming race music. He he redid a Bob Dylan cut, um, blowing in the wind. In the wind. It, it sounded different from when Sam did it. He had sped it up and it had a little bit more pop to it, but it was the same lyrics. And you understood something was happening with this brother. And so did the powers that be, the FBI, as they start to pay attention. Who is this dude? Um, they said when Sam Cook was killed, the L.A. police, because he was killed in, in L.A. and the 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 district. Uh, police station where he got killed at the white officers in the district was like who is this nigga that everybody and that's literally those are the words they use that everybody keeps calling the station about we're getting calls from far away as London like tell me that Sam Cooke was just not murdered but the ability to have people that's willing you know and they they talked about um, that speaking truth to power and where that phrase originated and People that are willing to stand up and do that. That's why, as I think about this election season and all of the different voices you're going to hear and the calls that's going to come through, who are the people willing to stand up for you? And and it's got to be bigger than one issue. It's got to be bigger than just, you know, my student loan or my 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 coal factory job. It's so much that goes into us having a quality of life. And people become mired in one issue, one topic, one thing. But it takes more than that to have a family, to have a, 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 a home, to have a, a, a quality of life worth living. Let me go to the phone line. Hey, caller, what's happening? Good morning, good morning, good morning. How good morning. How you doing this morning? I'm doing great. That's, Hang on. Do you have us on speaker? No. Okay. No. It sounds like it's muffled. Go ahead. Let's see if we can make it. It, might, it might be the it might be the heat on blowing in the in the wind. Okay. I know we in white conference. We all know we in white conference. Y'all know these people do not care about us. And we gotta go hard for us. And if we don't go hard for us, we're gonna be fighting this battle long after me and you are gone. And these people need to realize that it's gonna take all of us to really realize that this that life has a meaning and it ain't just about color so for people to think that black folks are evil and ungrateful stop it that's all i have to say all right thank you bro and you know because yeah. a number of people have called in and i appreciate the call a number of people have called in over the course of the last couple of weeks and they've used that phrase they don't care about us. And I never say it, but in the back of my mind, I always hear Michael Jackson's song, uh, They Don't Care About Us. And, you know, again, tying it into this whole thing about leadership and entertainers and individuals deciding that enough is enough. When Ray Charles says, I'm not going back to Georgia to perform as long as you're talking about segregated venues. Sam Cooke saying, I'm not going to uh, perform at a segregated venue again and he had even worked it out with the other people on the on the uh, show and they were all supposed to not go and on 
the day of the performance, Sam Cooke's boy comes to the hotel, the Lorraine Motel, where, where King was later shot, uh, assassinated. And he says, Sam, they all gone. And Sam sat on his bed. He was like, yeah, I know. Like all of the cats that had just stood and made a pack, we not performing because they they discriminating against black folks. We not going to perform. All of them went to perform. Sam Cooke was the only one that stayed back and his boy that came to meet him. And Sam just looked like, hey, sometimes you got to do it by yourself, bro. But I'm not going. Michael Jackson, when he makes They Don't Care About Us, which ultimately reaches the top 10 in Billboard's, Billboard's hot R&B um, singles, he literally wrote this as a protest song against all forms of prejudice. Get Spike Lee to come in and direct basically what ends up being short films for this song. Go back and watch that, that song sometime. And, you know, you you feel it when Michael is singing and where he chooses to shoot the location for this song, that there comes a time in people's lives when you got to pick a side. And, and you risk it all because Sam Cooke's fan base, he had black, but he had crossed over. He was doing major white television shows. They talked about that Dick Clark had... Uh, brought uh, Sam Cooke on to the show. And the KKK in the city that he was going to be performing did not want Sam Cooke on that stage. And so they was threatening to kill people and do all kind of damage. And Dick Clark used his connections to have the National Guard be present so Sam Cooke could perform. You think about that. You think about that. Dick Clark called in favors so that the National Guard, and you see all of this in the documentary, the National Guard is standing there so that Sam Cooke can come on that stage in a predominantly white setting. Michael Jackson, his fan base, we all loved him. But if you went to the concert, you saw who was at the concerts. His, his sphere of reach was ridiculous, and it was worldwide. The world mourned when Michael Jackson died. So for Mike to come out and say, they don't care about us. And then you, you see all these black children and black people in his video. So while I'm saying... Prejudice against anybody is wrong. Mike is making a definitive point with who is in that video. At some point in time in your life, you got to make a decision where you stand it and how you moving and if you helping or if you in the damn way. You got to make a decision that I see my community. I'm bringing my community. I care about this community. I'm going to fight for this community. Or just get out the way. To be in a room and call it here I come. Muhammad Ali. Malcolm X. Jim Brown. Former NFL player. Um, Sam Cooke. Then you got these other brothers on the peripherals. James Baldwin. You got some of the baddest boys moving and women. Because nobody has these conversations and don't mention Nina Simone. Or Angela Davis. Or any number of other folks. Do you know, man, you talk about the dream team. That's the stuff that gets me moving. Like, oh my God, I don't have to watch nobody else's stories because ours are so powerful. And what, what was possible had people not been threatened and chose to cut these people down in a prime in some cases? Let me go to the phone line. Hey, caller, what's happening? Good morning, uh, Michelle Keon. Good morning. Uh, Yes, you um definitely on point. Um yeah, a couple of things. One you talk about 
um, the star power. I was just watching, and I recommend people watching this because uh, I'm still looking at that that um, children's march in that time period. I was just watching on uh, Eartha Kitt versus the White House. Oh yes, There's some tapes that's been released. I knew about her speaking out, but actually hearing her voice and seeing the video of her stepping to President Lyndon Johnson about um, a meeting in which the Johnsons had, Mrs. Johnson had um, had for women dealing with violence in the community, the same thing we talked about in crime. And uh, Eartha Kitt spoke out about um, the poverty and the poverty related to the effect on us of our, our population being affected and then us being blamed for crime when the conditions um, created, which many government reports show. And after that meeting, um, they banned Eartha Kitt. That's right. And eliminated her from ever um, coming out. And so I think um, Boomerang, when Eddie Murphy um, had her on um, Boomerang, you know, before the end, she was um, nullified, even though she was the best cat woman in the history of the of the, the uh, franchise. Uh, franchise. That's right. You know, she's the one that gave the purr. Nobody, you know, that was something she brought to the brought to the character. And now all cat women's is purring when they talk um, because of her. But they put the CIA on her, right? you know, to do a dossier. And that's all in the New York Times, the New York Times report that in the 70s. But I bring that up because you are talking about, you mentioned great women, and that just came to my mind. But also how, you know, we, we've been talking about mental health um, with our population. And that we don't, and when you talk about Dexter, and the uh, um, children fighting. One of the things I've noticed in going to funerals of uh, very um, prominent, you know, international leaders of our, uh, uh, our population, of our people, um, is that the children really don't understand the magnitude of their parents or parent or parents. And they all talk about that at the funerals. And being jealous and thinking they missed out. And we have to really understand and have some therapy around our families as well and children as it relates to understanding that when you make the decision to fight for us as a people, that that's a decision that in the past we had really had community support to kind of up, uplift um, those value systems and pick up. Um, the perceived slack the children may see that they're missing in their lives. Because that's not talked about. We talk about our leadership pain. But we don't talk about the pain that is expressed on our children and how our our, our population is not addressing that. Um, the other thing is our loss into organizations um, like the local Black Panthers, who used to go up to Whitewater and other universities to let... Um, the white racist population know that um, y'all know if something go down, even though we not on campus, we don't be back, you know, to make sure that um, uh, our people is protected or we get some correction and pressure on y'all the way y'all need pressure put on y'all. Um, those things have been um, greatly missed that we have to reorganize those things. And like you said, we have to look at the this greatness of our people and, um, empower our spirits i said this before one of the best things that we can do for our health is boost our immune system and one of those things is feeling good about you feeling good about you and your life and situation despite all the stresses and pressures that's on you i mean darby said it you have to fight to live we got 14 pounds of pressure on our body just mm. being on the planet earth we got pressure all around us so we have to recognize that's a part of life and that there are tools that help us overcome. And when we overcome, or we work to overcome, when our body and the creator rewards us by boosting our immune system, by feeling good, when you talk on the mic and get excited, or Keon and other people call in to express, those things boost the immune system. So we need to constantly empower ourselves and uh, keep up the good work always. Thank you so much, bro. I really appreciate your comments. Always, always something that we can use uh, when you call in. And, you know, you said something. And I want to just do a quick pivot, if I could, for a sec. Um, you mentioned um, the word funeral came up. So yesterday there was a homegoing service 
for a brother by the name of Harrison Moore. And I had talked to a bunch of, you know, what I consider some heavy hitters that are older brothers in the community. And they had all mentioned that they had been to this funeral for Harrison Moore. And I was like, you know, I'm not from Milwaukee. So who is Harrison Moore? And somebody said, Michelle, the brother who owned Ham's, uh, Handsome's Barbershop. And I was like, I heard of Handsome's Barbershop before. There's like 20, uh, like Tatonia in the center area. But it was one of the first black barbershops in the city of Milwaukee. And I was like, oh. So then I come in this morning and I'm asking Keon, like, do you know who this brother was that passed away that so many people were um, paying their regards and respects to yesterday? So Keon starts making calls. We end up talking to my, my boy Mo. Um, who was able to give us like a little bit of backstory, like, yeah, this is one of the first brothers to open a barbershop in the city of Milwaukee, black owned barbershop in the city of Milwaukee. He was one of the more brothers. And then I didn't know. And they, he, Mo draws the line. This was Booby's brother. Booby was a barber. Booby, Booby from Booby's 502. And before Booby opens the bar, Booby had a barbershop. And, you know, then he mentioned another brother, Thaddeus. But the Moore brothers, I guess, was the bomb, you know, or the shiznit in this community. And it's like, wait, what? But I knew from the people who was telling me that they had attended this service or was celebrating this brother's life yesterday. I'm like, Michelle, you need to figure out who was this man. And so for those of you that had ever either frequented the barbershop, knew Harrison Moore, uh, you know, just my, my respect and my uh, condolences on the loss of what appears to have been like a, another icon in the community, man. Right. And my father said that wrong. It was Ozell's 502. Then it was Boobies. We it was that. Ozell's first. Ad was um, Adeline uncle. Pressy just tapped in. Yeah. She said he was a good friend of mine. Now, if you remember, was that you who Clay were interviewing Claiborne when he said, or he might have just told me that Booby raised him. Booby and his no, wife. I remember hearing that. Yeah, Claiborne okay. Benson. I was like, what? He said, they, they pretty much adopted me and raised me. Really? I was like, whoa. So mm -hmm. speaking of Claiborne, we're going to be getting him in on a regular basis over the course of uh, February, talking about some black history with him. But uh, OK, so phones lit up. Let's see what's happening. I got to go to break or OK. Excuse me, callers. If you can hang in with me, let me take a quick break and I'll get you uh, on the other side. Michelle Bryant, WNOV, 860 AM, 106.5 FM. Be right back, y'all.
Michelle Bryant on 860 WNOV. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You got issues. Right. You got issues. Right, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me cut it out. I'm not going to be Ricky Ticky this year. Not Ricky Ticky Tabby. Uh, Ricky uh, Ticky. Uh, you know, like Ticky Ticky Boom. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so special. Got callers that help through the break. I want to get them in. Hey, caller, what's happening? Hey, good morning, Michelle. I just want to tell you that I love you so much, and thank you for bringing this topic. Um, we're talking about a lot of different things. Um, but I wanted to, since we're doing, like, a little bit about Black history, I wanted to talk about Gordon Park. Please. Uh, iconic, <laughs> uh, iconic photographer that documented our history of our life. Not only was he a photographer, he was a composer. He was a film director. He was so much in our life and he 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 talked about the right the civil rights the poverty of our african americans he put that in film he put that in photos he put that in magazines and i just i mean we can talk about musicians but let's talk about the photographers that captures those moments right um right. and gordon parks is somebody that is very iconic to me and i just wanted to share that and for the young people that's listening, if you're if they are listening, that you we you look Gordon Parks up and figure out who he is and how instrumental he is to our to our history. Thank you, you know. so much. No, thank you so much, sis, for adding that that name to the mix. I mean, you know, yeah, we can do our pre February celebration all day long with me three sixty five, as McDonald says. You know, I immediately in in addition to the photos, I go to uh, the filmography. Uh, credits of Gordon Parks, the learning tree uh, just goes down for me. Shaft's big score, Shaft, um, Lead Belly. He did Martin in 1990. Like this man was so ahead of his time. It was crazy when you think about the genius of a Gordon Parks. So yes, uh, I definitely, and in fact, I'll, I'll spend a little time on him uh, as we get ready to roll through um the next several weeks because you're right. He, he, you, you can't have some of these conversations and Gordon Parks, his name, not be in the mix. Got another caller. Hey caller, what's happening? Hey, good morning to you. Good morning, sir. How you doing this morning? Oh, blessed. I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. Good. I haven't heard you talk about your girl and I know it's kind of like off the topic, but you're talking about wonderful, marvelous people this morning. And I know how how much you really, really adore that uh, prosecutor guy. And I haven't heard you say anything about her. Uh, uh, not not this time. What, the what girl? Who? The, the prosecutor. I uh, talked about her yesterday. Yeah, but I'm talking about in the depths of where they hid it. How you, see, I don't care. They don't really care about Wait, the, but let me make sure we talk about the same person. You talking about Fonnie Willis? That's correct. Okay, go ahead. They don't. They want people to look at the smoke uh, of the 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 the, 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 the adulterous affair that she was having with the man while he was married. That that's just smoke. The real fire is that they don't have this the company's credit card taking trips. Okay, the taxpayer dollars. That's where they gonna nail her. At. She ain't gonna be able to get off like she tried to prosecute. See, you to, this is what I'm very careful and mindful of. Judge ye not that ye be not judged. Now watch this. For with what measures you judge somebody, you gonna also but, be. But but so but 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 but, but but let's not confuse can I, can biblical. Wait, let's not confuse biblical judge not ye judge with her doing her job as a prosecutor. <laughs> her job is to judge as as or to bring these cases forward as a prosecutor. So let's not confuse the context by which things are happening. The other thing is, while he may have still been married, he and his wife had been separated and estranged for years. So it wasn't not. like he was at the house and she was messing with him. Uh, if, in fact, they did and were having, you know, a relationship. 
and, you know, stealing some brother away from his happy home. He had been left his home. So, you know, it's not the same thing. Her job was to judge people. Her job was to make judgment calls about whether or not somebody had committed a crime or not and to move forward with the prosecution. It's not the same thing. I got to go and I appreciate it because um, I don't want to mess up the vibe this morning on that. Uh, Getting back to the vibe this morning, <laughs> I just find I want to play this for you as opposed to what you were talking about. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. How many roads must a man walk down? There it is. Before right. he's called a man. There it is. Tell me, how many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Tell me, how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? No, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer, blowing in the wind. Ha. How many times must a man look up before he sees the sky? Tell me, how many ears must one man have? Before he can hear people cry. What I want to know is how many deaths will it take till he knows? Too many people have died. Oh, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer, somewhere in the wind. Ah. How many years can a mountain? Exist. Oh, it's washed down to the sea. Huh. Tell me, how many years can some people exist before they allow them to be free? What I want to know is, how many times can a man turn his head, pretending that he just doesn't see? Oh, the answer, my friend. Blowing in the wind, the answer. Blowing in the wind, blowing in the wind, blowing in the wind, the answer. Somewhere in the wind, oh, that answer is somewhere in the wind. Now back to six something real with your host, Michelle Brown. I gotta go. I got to go. So I just want to say I got an inbox on Facebook uh, from one of our uh, very loyal listeners, brother by the name of Alex. Alex said, that's the song Jenny was singing on the stage on Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? You, now, you know what? On that documentary, Legend, mm -hmm. his brother tells, Sam was upset. He loved that song, but he was upset because he said that song should have been written by a black man. And then he wrote, Change is going to come. So because, change, that, that comes. And, and I mean, because it, it wasn't just about that the song should have been written by a black man. He was talking about yeah, yeah, that it yeah, took yeah. a white man to, to perform right. it to raise the right. issues, you know, impacting yeah. racism in communities right. of color. Right. And we should have been able to do that. Right. And, you know, but it, the thing, too, Sam though, that you had her. to be you know, conscientious of is that all this comes at great risk because right. a white man got way more freedom than a black man ever could. Mm -hmm. White boys can say whatever they want to bring up whatever they want to most of them, most of them yeah. sing about at that time you know there were still some folks trying to rein in white men who um had a different world view other than racism and white supremacy but you know so i, I certainly appreciated what he said mm -hmm. but i also understood that you know bros knew they could be killed yeah. or blackballed as we mm -hmm. saw in in so many situations in relationship to that but that that line how many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man Man, come on. And then I think about I was watching 
I forgot which documentary it was with Sam and Samuel L. Jackson. It was the Quincy Jones video yeah. uh, documentary. And Samuel L. Jackson was talking about leaving Morehouse campus. Because yeah. it, it still blows me away that Samuel L. Jackson is like 75 years old. Yeah. I just don't see him that way. But that they left Morehouse, where he attended school in Atlanta, and went to Memphis after King was assassinated to march and they talked about wearing and having those i am a man signs right. and that those signs stayed in their homes for years right. you know and like you just don't think about like all the stuff that these people have seen and you know we hear samuel jackson and everybody like you know he best known for his mf lines and you know these movie parts yeah. but that these brothers were conscious and in the movement and paying attention and that's why i just want to say to meach you know um Bro, know how to read a room, fam. You got to learn how to read a room. Right now, we on uplift. We on positive. We talking about the issues impacting us as a people. This wasn't a moment to try to drag a sister. It's a time and a place for it. It's a valid observation. I had this conversation yesterday. I'm going to have it again. But learn how to read the room. Don't come in and start shaking salt when Cass is kicking it. Because that's what was just happening. And that's why I had to move on. Learn how to read a room. It's a time and a place for everything. That wasn't the time to try to drag a sister. <laughs> but... Right. Be truthful. I had to grab your choker chain. He <laughs> was waiting to get at that boy. <laughs> I don't know, but... No, I wasn't going to go. I wasn't going to go. I your wasn't gonna your go. leg was over there twitching. I mean, my leg is always twitching. <laughs> but that's a phrase that needs to come back, blow it in the wind. Yeah. Because it's the, it, that's what's wrong today. Things are still just flying in the wind, blowing and twirling, and we know better. You know what I'm saying? How many rows must a man walk down before he's called a man? We got a caller. Let's get him in. Hey, caller. What's happening? Hey, Michelle, good morning to good, you. Good, good morning, morning uh, Keon. What up, T? Keon, thank you for that. Thank you for that track, man. That was so, that was so cool. Um, I heard you uh, mention Hanson, Hanson's Barbershop. Yes. And the barbershop was uh, located on Walnut Street. And I attended that barbershop when I went to get a haircut 65 years ago. Oh, wow. Maybe earlier. Okay. Maybe earlier. And if there's anyone listening uh, in the Hanson's family, that the guy that owned the barbershop was a very good friend of my father's. And I have this here awesome picture of these here. It looked like they were in the basement somewhere, and they were all standing around, and they were all dressed to the nine. You know, they was, you know, drinking their shots, and it looked like they were just having a good time. So... Uh, I have that picture available, so if anybody's listening uh, from the Hanson family, uh, uh, Keon has my phone number. And, uh, but you know what? I want to do this, too, because I want to see if I can get a copy, because Claiborne Benson, who is basically the historian yeah. and the one who documents history in this city, when they start talking about that this barbershop was one of the first owned black barbershops in the city of Milwaukee, I know that that's a photograph that Claiborne Benson would want a copy of, too. You know what? If you could bring it up to me, hey, T, I could Walnut, scan it. Yeah. Hey, 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 Walnut Street. Before Walnut Street looked like it looked, look now, it looked so different back then. You know what I'm saying? And he was the only black barbershop that mm. my brother and I, my brother and I attended. You know, so I just had to call in and. Uh, and you said more than sixty-five that. years ago. Yeah, more than sixty-five years ago, I used to go get my hair cut there. My dad, my mom used to take take us up and get our hair cut. Thank you so much for that. And um, like I said, I will certainly reach out through Key because I want to get a copy. Like I said, to get it to Claiborne because. He has done an incredible job. And people, if you have, you know, historical photos uh, of this city, of people in this city, please consider calling Claiborne Benson over at the Wisconsin yes. Black Historical Society. If you don't do anything but give him copies of those photos, not your originals necessarily, because the stories of ours that have not been told. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that are being lost with each passing generation. So thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the call, bro. And to you also... Um uh, I, like I just said, uh, 
Claiborne that let me know that Booby pretty much raised him. So he may know every man on that picture. So I'll be able to identify who those gentlemen are. So let me see. Somebody just sent me something saying blowing in the wind was also done by Stevie Wonder. Let me look and see. Oh, yeah, he did do it when he was a young dude. Oh, it was amazing. That is so crazy. I mean, like I said, you just don't, you just don't even I mean, once again, it. that was the activism work. By, and, and then Bob Dylan was, was a hell of an activist. He was. He know? was. Oh, you know what else they said? That they mimic the activists like uh, uh, the Four Tops. Levi was like, uh, you know how he said, uh, uh, when you feel confused and something, something to lose. He said that was Bob Dylan. That oh, really? Dylan buy, and all oh, things is now and gone. Oh, yeah. Because all that, your troubles are gone. That's that sound. That was, that was the, mimicking the activists. <laughs> so somebody just hit me up on Facebook. They said some history for Milwaukee. I mean, some history for Milwaukee. My dad was in a social club, the unique social club. The black men in this social club were socially conscious. They all invested in a black beer brewing company called People's Beer. They were all business owners. I've heard, heard of People's that. Beer. I definitely remember that. So, okay, I need to do, do some digging. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, for sharing that with me. Uh, I got to do some digging. <laughs> I got to do some digging. That's socially conscious. On the phone. Uh, what? Who's up? Vaseline, man. What up, Mr. Look, don't make me start. Hey, bro, how you doing? <laughs> Call me the Vaseline. The Vaseline. Go ahead, go ahead, say it. Happy, happy, Mr. Vaseline Day. Go ahead. What's he, up? He said cook. He said DJ. He said Vaseline. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't say good morning, foodies. He say happy Vaseline Day. Hey, he didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say, uh, uh, business owner. <laughs> yeah, you, you missed all them titles. Yeah, yeah. Missed, he, he didn't frame none of this correctly for you. Yeah. <laughs> no. I did say, wait a minute, hold on. What up, DJ Trotter? <laughs> <laughs> that's not much better, man. But well, you be messing with us because our cold weather. You was about to tease us till I said it. No, nah, you know, I, I wasn't because, you know what? Because it's raining here, too, but y'all got some different kind of rain. Y'all got some freezing rain. Oh, yeah. It's it's nonsense going on here. Nothing like Phoenix. It's all nonsense. It's been, it's been raining for two two days here. Really? We supposed to get yeah. it this week. I think Wednesday through uh, Friday, we supposed to have rain for two or, two or three days. So what, why meet remind me of the uh, dude from Dave Chappelle, uh, Tyrone Bisbee, that he knows he think he white until he, because he blind. <laughs> oh. Like, dude, you black dude. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I don't what think he divorced his wife for messing with a black man. Yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, 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 dude you, it's, it's, dude, you sound like you got a white wife. You, you're bashing all of the sisters. You sound like a broke pimp with some old Stacey Adams. Come on, man. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Nobody wanted to No, 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 no. Hold on. Let, 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 hold on, DJ. Hold on, DJ. In, in, in me's defense, he got crocodiles with real crocodile heads on it. And snake skins with real snakes on it. He, wait, got, wait, he wait. really does. He really does. And he got the meat. Do we, do we, does he does he have the Chicago hat on with the with the crocodile with the cock in the middle? No, no, I think he no. got a meat with the meat head on it. I don't know. The the head of the alligator is really on really his stuff. And he got a bag with it too. <laughs> See? See? I can it tell. is, man. I, I think tell. we got a picture. We we, we took a picture. And and it's and it's and it's cur and it's curl is dried up too. <laughs> You know what? See, look, by Arizona. <laughs> I got <digress>, grass. Right? <laughs> he, he cut deep. By Arizona. Yeah. You know, called him from a whole other oh. state. Cutting deep. Um, you know, let me mention this. With no Vaseline. A couple of things. People are sending text messages. They rolling through. Uh Priscilla Cox checked in, County Supervisor Priscilla Cox. And she said, Where is PC at? She said, my dad is a relative of Mr. Moore of Handsome Barbershop. And they were at Mr. Harrelson's uh, home going uh, on yesterday. Uh, somebody else checked in and said, my first haircut was at uh, Samson's Barbershop. I, I, I don't know if that's supposed to be Handsome or Samson's Barbershop on 7th and West Galena. Uh, so that person checked in. Um, somebody else said, uh, that history began back in 1955 when Ozell Howard and Henry King Moore opened Ozell's 502, 502. Club. Mm -hmm. 
considered by some to be the oldest licensed, um, I think the oldest licensed bar. Well, no, black owned bar, oh, black owned yeah, bar. maybe black owned, but Ozell's 502. And we now know today that Mr. Jewel Curry, uh, and it was another brother, um, off, I mean, not um, Jewel Curry, and um, what's your brother's name now who owned 502? It's in the text. He was talking about Jewel in the text, I know, but the other owner, I think, Jewel, I think it's Jewel and another owner who owned 502 now, um, and that Jewel Curry who infamously. You know. No, no, he we, we, he was talking about Ray Thurman, who Jewel and Ray Thurman played Arthur Ash. Oh, they played Ar King, okay, yeah. okay. At Rufus King, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So got that. Uh, let me see. Got another caller on the line. Let's get them. In. Oh, wait. Speaking before I bring the caller up. Speaking of, um, <laughs> let's see. Now I'm about to act like me. <laughs> you know what? No, I ain't gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna ruin this moment by talking about Tim Scott's engagement. I'm not gonna do it. See, I almost see, I almost, I almost did it. Uh, let me go to the phone line. Hey, caller, what's happening? Hey, Miss Michelle, how you be? I'm good, bro. How you doing, Lamar Franklin? I'm doing good. Just listen. Listening to you talking, I was just so ooh, we just make my toes twinkle. You know, hey, twinkle. I want to know this is something that news is not saying, and I'll be watching very closely. Now, one of the countries has learned how to make an aircraft carrier and has made one last week, Friday, and have the planes to back it up. Now, a lot of people don't understand what I'm saying, but those who need to know need to Google it and find out. Now, here's the thing. We sourced out our um, schematics and stuff like that to get it built in China where it's cheaper, right, when things used to be made in USA. But since we sourced out our business so much, China now can make an aircraft carrier in two years which it takes us six years to make. So now in eight months, they can make a plane where it takes us 13 months to make a, a plane that fits that, that aircraft carrier. Now do the math, and I'm telling you people, and you looking at trying to mess with Mr. Um, Trump to be elbow next to people and how he talks about people and how he elbows and, and starts stuff, Okay, now we done sourced out everything, and now they're making what takes us six years, they can make it in two. Understand what's happening, people, and they're selling the plane, the aircraft carriers to Israel and other parts of other things that need to be bought. Understand what's happening with our trade and that we're not making anything in America no more, and the stuff that we've learned to make that others didn't know how to make it are now copying and making it. Understand two years and it takes us six years to make an aircraft carrier. Those who don't know what it is, look it up, see what it takes to make, see the things that are going to it and what other countries they have to buy the things that make this thing and who are they dealing with. See, we, we're not looking at Trump and what he will mess up. Okay, I'm done. Okay, I hear the music. Y'all take it back. All right, thank you, bro. There was no music. <laughs> that's, that's the second person that heard music. Like, hey. There was no music. Mm -hmm. We wasn't rushing you, fam. We was not rushing you at all. Uh, just got a text message. Someone said, two of my sons are at Whitewater. Students are afraid, especially the new students. Please tell our sons and daughters to not respond violently to rings, they will be arrested or possibly attacked. Whitewater is a sundown place. Can, can I please, before you go, dog, because you were at Whitewater for a minute too, right? I never attended Whitewater. Oh, you just, okay. Yeah, I would go on the yard. Yeah, so um, a lot of my guys, we've always been up there. When my sister was there, she's six years older than me. So in the 90s and late 80s, you know, and definitely when my friends got up there, you know, we would have to go up there to handle business. Because you got to understand, Janesville is a clan town, and that's where Geraldo Rivera got into a fight on national television with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Is that when his nose got broke when they threw that chair? No, no, that was in the studio. Oh, okay. oh that's right. <laughs> that that's was right. a black that was dude. It. No, he was on the ground getting it on. He went to a rally in real life, got into a fight, and was on the ground throwing punches and scuffling with the Grand Wizard of the Klan in Janesville. 
right next door. So you got to remember to tell your children that when they go into Whitewater, because that's a school that a lot of our kids go to. And it's like the hype school. That's what they, I'm going to the water. So I'll be like, oh, okay, be ready. You know what I'm I mean, saying? yeah, because before the kids that want to leave home, yeah, it's close, you know, but you still get to stay in the state, right. but have that college experience. A lot of, particularly black children, um, like to go to UW Whitewater. Yeah, nothing, it, yeah, yeah that's 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 the thing. But you know, it's one of those things I think we have to do to work as parents to educate our children about you know the environments that they're walking into, and some of our parents don't even know; they have no idea right. what's waiting on these children. But I remember when I was making decisions about my son and his college attendance, because my son was hell bent on going to university of Michigan because he was going to play football, wanted to go, wanted to go, wanted to go. And I was like, mm -mm, no, sir, not freshman year. Um, I just, I just couldn't see it, you know? And one of the things is having gone to a PWI predominantly white institution, I just know what it meant to be a black face on a ocean of a, a white campus in which people don't see you. And don't really care that you're there. And, you know, nobody's going to check for you, you know, to make sure that you're good. I always understood that. I wanted him foundationally to get what was offered at an HBCU, particularly as a black male. That nurturing, that encouragement, that belief that, you know, I know you bright and you brilliant. You don't have to prove that you belong. Just sit down and get your work done. Just do what you 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 mean to do. Um, thank you for the correction, bro. This is Andre going back and forth with me out here. And uh, he just meant to say, he meant to talk, he meant to say the word racism, not rings. Got you. Um, but, you know, so it's just one of those things. We don't. We don't adequately prepare our children uh, coming from one environment to go to another. I always tell people you got to be careful about what it is you're giving your kids because in our quest to give them what we didn't have, we end up sometimes messing them up. We think that you know, this is a better environment and this is the best place for you. It's a trade-off. I got a quality education, but what did I lose by way of, you know, my, my self-esteem, my identity, my culture, you know, like, and some people are like, well, it was worth it because you can now be in the C-suite. Yeah. But if I'm struggling every day with trying to understand my place in the world and how I fit in, was it worth it? Because there's some people come out of these situations completely jacked up, having attended a PWI. So you got to know your child. You need to know where you're sending them. And you need to check in on them regularly. Pop up visits to these campuses. And the one thing that I did right away when my son went to Alabama State, me and the dean, first name basis, got to be real cozy. Because, well, nobody be messing over that one. Now, I don't care what go on, even at a black institution. I don't care what happened and when it happened. When it comes to that one, well, nobody be messing over him. Mm -mm. Not as long as I'm breathing. No, sir. And even in death, you won't be messing over that one. <laughs> Just, that needs to be said. All right. So we are near the end of the show. Today is Tuesday. I get out of here early uh, for Mr. Frazier. Uh, but I just I just want to just circle back on this one thing if I could. Because there were a lot of things that I could have talked about today. I could have talked about the Barada properties and the frozen pipes and the water. I'm so, bless you, babe. And the pipes so frozen that the water in the toilet thank was frozen. You, um, on see, what'd you say? Thank you, babe. I said thank you, babe. <laughs> and you don't have to tell people because I say bay a lot, and I realize like you can't say that to everybody. <laughs> you, you can't say, but I say bay all the time. Um. Uh, and I said to me and that women, I'd be like, thank you, man. And, you know, and you can always see, like, young girls smile. Like, I sound like they auntie or they mama. They just be like, oh, you know, she care about me. And little bros be like, wait, what she say? Sit down, boy. Did nobody mean it like that? So that's funny you said that. Oh, thank you, man. <laughs> All right, y'all. I got to get out the way. But I just want to say, while I could have talked about any number of topics today that were highly important uh, to us, sometimes you just got to take a moment. When they say, you know, smell the roses, you know, just to take it all in. Every day I wake up, I'm proud to be a black person. Every day I wake up, I'm proud of who we are and the contributions we make that go unnoticed frequently. Every day I understand the power and what we have the potential to be. So today it was just a homage and a love story to black folks. All right, family. What you say? Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, family, I got to get out the way. Key, I appreciate yep, you, bro. Yep. 
Peace, y'all. Ricky Dicky. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to WNOV 860 and W293CX 106.5 Milwaukee.